Welcome to Electron Online, and now we're going to talk about the discovery of the pion. Now, what did we know? Back in the 1930s, what we knew was that there were such things as protons, neutrons, and electrons, the most basic particles that most everybody's familiar with. We also had discovered in 1932 there was such thing as anti-electrons or positrons, the antiparticle of the electron. Also, we postulated that there were such things as, as um, neutrinos and such things as photons. Now, in 1905, Einstein had already discovered that electromagnetic radiation or light it actually consists of quantized chunks of energy called photons. But we did not yet have the experimental uh, ability to figure out what neutrinos were and to capture neutrinos in an experiment to determine that those particles actually existed. We did uh, theorize that neutrinos were probably very small, very light particles, maybe massless, and that they moved at very high speeds, maybe at the speed of light. But we had not yet discovered those particles. In addition to that, in 1905, Einstein had discovered the equation e equals mc squared, probably the most famous equation in physics, and that equation related energy and mass. Basically, that energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing. Also, in addition to that, Heisenberg, in 1927, had postulated the uncertainty principle. He had postulated that it was impossible to determine the position and the momentum of a particle accurately at the same time, and also, it was impossible to determine the energy and the time span of that energy uh, accurately at the same time. So, in 1935, Hideki Yukawa, a very famous physicist from Japan, proposed an interesting concept. Why he did that was because we had a very big problem on our hands, the big mystery. Why does the nucleus of an atom not explode? Because the nucleus of an atom has a bunch of these positive protons in it that repel each other with enormous force, just absolute enormous force. Having protons that close together just has this enormous force trying to push them apart. But yet, nuclei of atoms do not do that. So, what kept a nucleus together? Well, there had to be that strong force. And there was already a lot of research taking place, taking advantage of the fact that we knew e equals mc squared, and we already started an experiment with the decay of atoms, and the concept that if you split a large atom to smaller atoms, that the mass of the smaller atoms were less than the mass of the big atom, and therefore energy was lost, and there was this E equals mc squared relationship between the energy loss, or the energy given off, and the mass lost by that reaction, or by that nucleus, nuclear decay. So we knew there had to be some sort of strong force keeping that nucleus together. But what was it and how did it work? We didn't have a clue at the time, although some very smart people like Yukawa began to think that there might be a particle that acts like an exchange, that acted like an exchange particle between, for example, the nucleons of a nucleus. And that exchange would then cause the force to keep it together, the nuclear strong force. Well, we did realize that, that the, the range of that force, the range of nuclear strong force had to be very, very small somewhere around the diameter of an actual, of like a proton or neutron, a nucleon. So it had a very, very small range. And so based upon that, and based upon the uncertainty principle, Yukawa began to surmise uh, that there was a small particle, a mass that would be inversely proportional to the range of the effect of that particle that would then act as the exchange between two nucleons, like that, and therefore it would create or at least provide for that nuclear strong force. So what they did was they took this equation right here and they said, all right, we have the amount of energy contained within the particle, which then could be transformed to the mass right here. And so that, that times the amount of time that that particle would be in existence would have to be around, and if you make that into an equal sign, approximate equal sign, uh, it would have to be equal to h bar, which is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, divided by 2. All right. So how long would that particle be in existence? Well, let's say that that particle would travel a typical diameter of a nucleon. And a typical diameter of a nucleon, uh, the distance, therefore, traveled is about 1 times 10 to the minus 15 meter, which is roughly the size of a nucleon. And if we then use the equation that distance equals velocity times time, and if we assume that the velocity cannot be greater than the speed of light, so we say, that therefore, the distance is equal to uh, C times the amount of time that that particle be in existence, 
Then we can see that delta t can be replaced by the distance divided by c, the distance of course being the diameter of one of those nucleons. If we then plug that in here, we then have the delta E is equal to, oh, not equal to, I'm still multiplying it times, the distance it can travel divided by the speed of light, which would be approximately equal to h bar over 2. So if we now isolate, isolate the amount of energy that would be contained within the particle due to its mass, so again, using this equation e equals mc squared, we put the c there and the d down here. We can say that the energy, therefore, is equal to h bar times c divided by d times 2. All right, h bar is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds um, divided by 2 pi. And then we have the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then we have the distance, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. All right, I left the units off to make it a little bit cleaner. So now we have the energy in terms of joules, but it's better to turn the energy in terms of uh, electron volts. So then if we divide that by the relationship, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per electron volt, we now have this quantity in terms of electron volts. So with a calculator, of course, Yukawa didn't have a calculator, but he managed. He took that equation and went 6.626e to the 34 minus times the speed of light divided by 2, divided by 2, divided by pi, and divided by 1e to the 15 minus, and divided by 1.6e to the 19 minus, and he ended up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 98.8, so let's just call it 100 million electron volts. So his expectation was that there had to be some sort of particle that was roughly of the size of 100 million electron volt. Now if you keep in mind that the, the size of a proton or neutron is almost a billion electron volts, like 938 million, and that the size of an electron is about a half a million electron volts, that would fall somewhere in between the size of an electron and the size of a proton and a neutron. So since it was kind of an average size particle, middle of the road particle, he called that particle a meson, and that came from the Greek, letter, the Greek word meso, which meant middle. And so middle sized particle, about 100 million electron volts. We just had to go out and find it. So it turned out in 1937, Carl Anderson discovered a particle, and it turned out to have a mass of 106 million electron volts. But it did not have a strong interaction with the strong force, and so therefore they said it had to be a, not the right particle we're looking for, so we ended up calling that particle a muon. In 1947, Giuseppe Occhialini, he discovered a particle, and that particle had a mass of 139.6 million electron volts, and it turned out it had a very strong interaction with the neutron, the proton, so therefore with the strong force, and so said this got to be the particle that we were looking for. And it turns out it's not that far off from the rough estimate of the size of that particle. And so this was then called the pi meson, the pi particle, or meson for middle-sized particles. So all particles of this rough size are therefore called mesons, and this is therefore called the pi meson, using the letter pi to indicate this, the particle. And there it is. We found it. And of course, for that effort, for that brilliant, ingenious concept that he came up with, and then actually discovering the particle, uh, he received the Nobel Prize for that. I don't, didn't write down when he received the Nobel Prize, but uh, Yukawa did get the Nobel Prize for uh, postulating and calculating the size of the particle, which was then later found. So, tremendous discovery. And this is now known as one of those interaction or, or mediating particle of the strong force within the nucleons of the nucleus of, a, of an atom. So, fairly, uh, fairly brilliant concept. And yet, slowly but surely, all these postulates came, uh, were proven to be correct as we began to discover more and more of these particles. So the search continued, and the understanding of how matter was put together and how matter stays together began to become clearer and clearer with the discovery of these new particles.